One of the key aspects in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, in the last few years has been around productionizing and scaling the use of these um, services. And for that, at Data Futurology, we've uh, created the, uh, an event, which we've run a couple of years now. We call it Advancing AI. So we want to be advancing the deployment of these systems in production at scale. We also want to advance the use of these capabilities throughout the organizations. And we always cover the most relevant and best topics that we can find. And we're definitely keen to see you there in the next one. This year's 2022's Advancing AI is going to be in person in Melbourne, April 6th and 7th at Crown Promenade. I hope to see you there. The lineup is looking fantastic. Please check it out on datafuturology.com. It's all gonna be geared around productionizing these systems, scaling them, and increasing the adoption of AI within our organizations and outside. April 6th and 7th, Melbourne, Crown Promenade. Advancing AI with Data Futurology. Thank you so much. See you there. I wanted to say a big thank you to our sponsor, Talent Insights. Talent Insights are Australia's leading data specialist recruitment business. They are experts in recruitment strategy and delivery for analytics and data teams. They are the go-to recruitment business for all your data roles in Australia, and they can help both with permanent hires and short-term project-focused data resources. I've used Talent Insights in the past, and I've always found them fantastic to work with. Visit them at talentinsights.com.au. Hey everyone, this is Felipe Flores from Data Futurology. Today, I have a very special guest um, sitting down with Dr. Jason Mars. He is a computer scientist, author, entrepreneur. You would have seen his TED talk. He's got a new book out. I'm super excited to sit down with him, uh, get to pick his brain and pass on any, any lessons so, um, from him to the rest of the audience. It's going to be a super exciting episode. Jason, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Good, good, good. Absolute pleasure to be here. Delighted uh, to have the honor to spend some time with you and uh, chat. Yeah. Right. Same, same here. So um, first of all, for, for the, the people that might not know you, can you give us a little bit about, uh, about a little bit about your background um, and some of the amazing things that you've done? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I'm Jason Mars. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering at University of Michigan. I'm also an entrepreneur and an author, and uh, I really care deeply about creating uh, impact in the world. And, and, and you know, I, I, I'm a tinkerer at heart, and I've always tried to uh, experiment and explore and, and let my curiosity drive me in, in different directions. But ultimately focused on um, making a difference in the world and bringing, uh, moving our species forward. Um, so uh, my background is in uh, artificial intelligence at scale. Um, I've worked at, on large scale computing systems for many years. Um, you know, I've written about a hundred research papers and I've uh, worked with 14 plus uh, PhD students uh, in academia and in industry. I've started a number of companies. I've grown uh, one technology company to $200 million valuation, bringing state-of-the-art conversational AI to market. I'm now working on a new technology stack that I believe will be um, uh, uh, highly important moving forward. It, it really takes the lessons from academia and industry uh, uh, to create the kind of technology that can define the next 10 years of artificial intelligence and scalable systems. So, um, yeah, happy to happy to join. Mate, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, I love both the um, the breadth of of your your skills and your passion and the depth mm -hmm. that you that you've gone with with each of each of the areas. That's amazing. What drew you into AI in the in the first place? Yeah. So you know, it's it's interesting, right? Uh, us us humans, uh, we've we've always been fascinated with um, pushing technology to be ever more useful in our lives. And, um, you know, we've been on this crazy journey just for the last hundred years or so of really engaging computing technology and, and, and understanding after inventing, understanding the internet uh, and understanding how we can always be connected. And it's, it's part of our, our deepest, most uh, psychological, um, you know, desire to, 
uh, be able to engage with technology in the most natural way possible. It turns out that we uh, engage with each other as intelligent beings engaging with intelligent beings. We have conversations with each other. Uh, we grow from those conversations. We, we get inspired uh, by each other. So it's only natural that we as a species um, want to push technology toward um, artificial intelligence or something that mimics the intelligence we bi were biologically evolved to uh, uh, engage with. And so, um, you know, a number of years ago, uh, after embarking on understanding search and social and, and the, the foundation of the internet and how we're connected, uh, we started working on the kind of algorithms and technologies that would define the next decade of, of tech advancement. Uh, and so uh, we took the whole lab in the direction of working on the holy grail artificial intelligence problems at scale. Uh, and in that journey, um, you know, we came to uh, a number of insights that uh, we thought we could commercialize. But, but really this all started when I was, you know, a teenager, uh, I, was, uh, I, I got interested in computers through a desire to create video games. Uh, and Gosh. one of the first creations we create, I've created was um, an AI essentially that would design and generate levels to play for a game called Quake. And so I guess that was my first a taste of technology and artificial intelligence. Mate, that is incredible. That is incredible. And then over time, um, you focus more and more on on uh, on conversational side of mm -hmm. AI, on on mm -hmm. on text, on being able mm -hmm. to have that that intelligence um, yeah. that humans can interact yeah. more and more. Um, what um, what made you passionate about that that space? Yeah, well, you know, if you look at it, you know, and it's a very fascinating to watch. Uh, I recently actually gave a talk where I did some research into how we got here. And it's, 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 it's interesting, right? So, you know, in, a, in the 1980s, we really started to engage personal computing. And then uh, in early 90s, we, we started to harness the Internet. Um, and in 1999, 2000, we had the dot com dot bomb bubble, right? where the market was early realizing the potential this technology had. Uh, soon after, you know, Google realized how to organize the in internet in a way that made it incredibly useful. And at the same time that Google started to realize this, uh, this, this journey, 2004, 2005 is when they really started to monetize things and grow. Facebook came onto the scene in 2004 and Amazon started to really scale in 2004, 2005. And so, and so this get, that's a long answer, but I'll get there, I promise. Uh, that was good. Yeah, so, so at that moment, we started creating data at an insane rate, right? Once we started, understood how to harness the internet to be useful and we got interested in social connection through the internet, data started to come to the fore. Uh, and at the same time, our processing got really, really good. So these old AI models that were researched in the 70s and 80s, uh, neural network models, deep learning models, they finally had the environment for which they can shine, right? Because they need a lot of processing and a lot of data in order to be smart. And so uh, in 2010, is when everything started to change. I, I, I call 2010 the year of the AI revolution. That's the year that Google did ImageNet and they, they did a project. This was a deep learning project. It's one of the first times that computer vision really took a deep learning focused approach to solving some holy grail image problems. So they did uh, ImageNet, you might remember this. We, they had folks like labeling what's in this image and Google was able to do that at scale because everybody was connected to Google. So they essentially got a bunch of free labor, people labeling <laughs> what's in the image. And they were able to show that when you have copious amounts of data and that kind of processing, you can actually dominate mm. some of the computer vision problems. That same year is when Siri was launched. Apple acquired Siri and launched the first product in 2010. So the market appetite was sparked for artificial intelligence and it really, boils down to those two domains. Computer vision, massive innovations started then. Then you had the face, the, the face recognition from Facebook, deep learning, all deep learning, a, a huge uh, renaissance uh, in artificial intelligence. And in the NLP space, the, the conversational AI space, 
the takeover of deep learning was a little slower, right? It took a, a more years for deep learning to dominate the language conversational AI space than vision. And fundamentally, and others would argue with me, I believe that the conversational realm is actually very hard because when we engage in conversations with others, we're accessing many, many subsystems of intelligence biologically, right? Vision, vision has, uh, I would argue, uh, simpler, uh, uh, in, an, in, an intelligence critical path to, to follow than a deep, complex conversation, which is very, very uh, hard to uh, reproduce that intelligence. And so it's a, it's a space that is highly uh, unsolved when it comes to the appetites of the market. And it's where most of the impact, much of the impact I think could be made because that's how we know to engage intelligence. When we wanted to build a better spear, when we lived in caves, we would go down to the other cave and say, I noticed your spears are awesome. How did you do it? Like, that's how we engage intelligence, right? And so it's a massive problem that's ripe for innovation and it's been moving way too slow. So, so I found myself drawn and attracted to that. And that's why I focus so deeply on uh, conversational AI. Uh, though asterisks, I, I do do some uh, interesting vision work in the realm of autonomous driving vehicles. Mm -hmm in the academic sphere, but I think the massive revolution that we need is in the, the conversational sphere, the NLP uh, uh, sphere. Awesome, awesome, yeah. that's great. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you, um, maybe I'll ask you first about if you can tell us some of the um, critical innovations or, or maybe uh, key points between uh, in the NLP space between yeah. uh, in the last decade, so 20, yeah. 2010 yeah, yeah. to now, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What have been the, the, the biggest improvements that you've seen? Um, yeah. And then after that, I'll ask you about um, uh, about the future. But yeah, yeah absolutely. Go, yeah, well, the, the fascinating thing is uh, there's two worlds that people are have to. I, I mean, I'm fortunate and lucky that I'm able to see this this technology space from two angles. All right. There's the there's a perspective that comes from understanding the market and the kind of products that folks are engaging in the market and what is having success. And then also look at the science uh, from a research uh, innovation perspective as to what's being published and publishing papers that are innovation myself. So from those two perspectives, it's actually a very interesting landscape, right? Because the kind of technologies that people are engaging every day with conversational AI does not represent the possibilities that come from the scientific discoveries that are going on. Now, this gap is closing and like, it's crazy because it's right, right before my eyes, like five years ago, the gap was larger. Now, if you look at, uh, if you look, especially in some of the startups and some of the academicians that are, are leaping into um, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial pursuits, um, the gap is shrinking a, a bit, but um, the biggest, the, 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 there's, there's a lot going on. Right, because I'm talking in the last three years, mm -hmm. the whole landscape has changed in, in terms of the science, how you can do this and what's possible to achieve. For a long time, um, it was 2012 that some of the foundational work on embeddings and word to vec happened, right? Uh, and that really is what whetted the appetite mm -hmm. of, of the market to innovate uh, with these large language models, right? You can actually train a model generally to understand language in such a way that it can understand meaning in a deep learned way. So it's not some feature selector teaching the model. It's the model just reads, it's called a self-supervised task, right? Go read the internet and learn everything you can. And then I'm going to put you to task, right? And one of the biggest innovations in this realm uh, came with uh, there's a paper called Attention is All You Need uh, that introduced this concept of a transformer. A transformer is a type of, it sounds cool because it's like transformers, robots in disguise, but it's a type of neural network model in the academic realm of sphere. It's a kind of neural network model that, um, that the reason why it became so interesting is because it was clear that recurrent neural networks is, are important in this space, which means the kind of neural networks that looks at the order of things, the sequence of things, 
because language is a sequence. It matters the order the words are in a sentence to understand what it means. If you were to randomize the ordering of the words in the sentence, you can't understand what it means as a human. So that intuition uh, was good, but it, the, there was a problem with the recurrent neural networks of the time, the LSTMs and the uh, uh, the classic recurrent neural networks, the, the, the G, gated recurrent units and so forth. The problem is that it's it, you can't use GPUs to train them. So we can't use all that processing amazingness that we were innovating to train these models. So it was, it was we were almost bottlenecked and capped with that. So transformers solves that with something called an attention layer. And so I don't want to uh, attention heads. I don't want to necessarily get too deep in the in the in that. But uh, it's 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 essentially a kind of neural network model that can both pay attention to the context of what words are in that sequence. And it can be trained really fast with all the GPUs and goodness. Now, almost every interesting technique in the academic sphere that's being published in the NLP space is using some kind of transformer. The most famous transformer everyone might have heard is BERT. Mm -hmm. Another famous transformer based model that everyone might have heard of is GPT. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the GPT-3 is the big thing, which is just a very, very big GPT-2. Anyway, whatever, details. But, but that has led, the, the, the idea of one neural network self-supervising, read the internet, read Wikipedia, read the news, read Reddit, and just learn on your own from what you can read. And then I'm gonna take that model and do cool stuff with it. That principle is what's dominating the thinking sphere today in, in the academic realm. And that's what's creating phenomenal results. So the results you see from GPT-3, for instance, is a massive transformer model that self-supervised, essentially reading the internet asterisks cleaned a bit. And it can, it, it's doing a lot of the phenomenal things people can say. I could get into the details of the applications if uh, if that's more interesting. I guess I'm coming at it from a pretty scientific pr perspective, but but so that's changing the world. And, and just very recently, like there, you've heard, I don't know, many folks may have heard of zero shot learning, which is a very sexy concept, which is, uh, this language model principle often was reasoned about in, in that they had to be fine-tuned. That means go read the internet, read Wikipedia. Then I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of data on my problem, which could be solve the SAT. Let's say that's your problem because these models could do stuff like that. But you read the internet, now go take the SAT. And, let's, and so in a fine-tuned model, you'll give it like two SAT tests that say, Here's the solutions. Now go solve the NSATs in general. That's a fine-tuned model. A zero-shot model or a zero-shot learning is go read the internet. I'm not even going to tell you what I'm going to test you on. And the, the model doesn't even know when it's learning self-supervised. Yeah. The model comes back and you're like, you know what? GMAT, <laughs> GRE, <laughs> the GREs, right? The LSATs, whatever. I'm going to give you some surprises yeah. and just go do it. And it turns out that we're discovering that if you give these models enough data and they're designed in the right way, they do incredibly well at these new tasks that they've never been trained for. There's a massive opportunity in the market for that kind of technology because the hardest thing that businesses are grappling with is training models to do what they want the models to do. It take, it's incredibly difficult. Like you can get some scientists and like, I don't know, there's like, there's such a limited number of scientists. There's not enough to yeah. spread around all the companies. You can get some scientists to come and try to train your model at your task, but that, because, that is not scalable from an economics perspective. So the promise of zero shot learning is you could let the scientists train this model once, and then you can toss the model into the market to solve many different problems. And then the market gets utility mm -hmm. out of those models. And so this also applies to another buzzword, uh, few shot learning and so forth. And the definitions of these terms are changing real time, paper by paper, month by month, right? Like, um, you know, some of this work uses, this is so super technical, but some of these works uses prompts. Some of these works are using a little bit of data to train and kind of calling it few shot. Uh, and some are doing task aware representations, which is let's give it a bunch of tasks and then it'll be really good at the new task, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but 
But anyway, from the scientist's perspective, that's the that's some of the exciting cutting edge stuff that's going on right now. On the industry, on the on the industry side, industry is moving so slow. It's almost frustrating when you can see what's going on in science, how slow industry is moving. But from on the industry side, um, there are a few good ideas in the startup realm of folks who understand what's going on in the science realm, and that's good. But we're seeing interesting solutions to problems, uh, you know, such as automatically generating marketing material, right? Like yep. that's really fascinating. And, uh, you know, a lot of the big companies are trying to um, turn their models into utilities. Actually, this is a business model that some of the most interesting AI stuff, unfortunately is happening, and I'll tell you why it's unfortunate, mm -hmm. but it's unfortunately happening with the utility-based computing business model. So they'll be like, I trade this awesome model, it's really big, I'm gonna let you send, send API calls to it and charge you five cents per call, yeah. right? Like that business model, yeah. but that's not downstream innovation. You know what I mean? And yeah. businesses don't know how to operationalize those, that, that utility effectively. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a massive opportunity where you have industry folks uh, leverage some of these innovations to design at, at the at where your users are touching the experiences to design for that, right? And not necessarily to design APIs for people. Um, so um, it's moving slower than I would like, right? We're not experiencing AI in our lives that's better. It's been like two decades and yeah. Siri is still terrible, right? Yeah. yeah. And like Alexa is still only useful when you want it to play a song, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I can't chat with my Alexa and feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. I can't have a conversation that lifts my mood with conversation. Why not? The tech, I would, I would submit, uh, my conjecture is that the tech is there if people invested energy mm -hmm. to create experiences that are, the, at, at, that are where the users are, right? And so, you know, I think, I think we're going to see more of that coming real soon. That's great. So what, what do you see as, as the gap today uh, between where things are at and when we can create those experiences for people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's a very important question, right? Because um, th these kinds of, so I call it a skyscraper approach, right? Where you'll see a lot of businesses get into a field, want to borrow the hype cycle buzzwords and just do a little bit better to differentiate themselves than their neighbors. That's not going to get us there. Actually, look at, look at Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon. <laughs> They're skyscrapering each other. Yep. And we're not feeling a new groundbreaking innovation in our lives. You have to look at the example, and this is almost so abused, I don't even want to mention this as an example, but you have to look at the example of, Steve Jobs, Apple, right? Mm -hmm. Where where you you innovate with risk, and you uh, and you do something uh, boombastic that's not better. And good examples of this, there's many, but there's the iPod. See, kids in my class today don't re don't remember iPod yeah. with the wheel. It's so crazy. Like that's not an ar archaic example, but that used to be the new stuff. But yeah. anyway, like yeah. But the iPod, right? Like, so like the iPod, it didn't have buttons mm -hmm. in, a, in a market where every MP3 player, and I think this is covered to some, to some degree in a book called, it's something simple, insanely simple, right? Uh -huh. But in a, market, in a market where you had 43 buttons on average per MP3 player, and everybody was like, how do we get more features? 44 buttons, 45 buttons. He was like, let's get rid of all the buttons. You know what I mean? Let's get rid of the CD, the CD drive. Yeah. That's not skyscraper. Yeah. That's that's uh that's uh you know that's audacious innovation. That's disruption. Mm -hmm. And it's risky because it can fail hard. You can mm -hmm. put the iPod with the wheel. Everyone's like, are you kidding me? Give me the 43 button version, your product dies, right? But that's the kind of innovation we need, not skyscraper, let me do better than my neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to wait until someone does something so real and so important that they change 
the skyscraper landscape, right? So if you create, let me, let me give you an example. If I create a conversational experience that literally made people feel better, like, and it worked yeah. and it was sophisticated enough to work and it, you, you pulled all the punches and you did something audacious, but it's like, you can chat with this thing and it'll lift your spirits. It's clever. It knows the internet. It's going to find the right jokes to tell you. Yeah. It'll have an interesting conversation and cheer you up. It'll guide you through some exercises to make you feel less anxious. Like, I think that then you have the creation of a novel skyscraper and then you'll let the competitors make it better and better. But we need these jumps, right? You know, you had Apple's iPod, then there was the Zune. Of course, the Zune died. I don't know why, because it's a great product. It had like one button, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's the Zune. Um, but then, and then there's iPhone and iPad. Now we have, now we live in a land of tablets. Uh, you have to remember how, how audacious the iPad was at the time. Just take the iPhone and make it bigger. And now the, we have massive number of tablets in the market. And so, so we're going to need that kind of disruption. Um, it's risky, but we're going to have to wait for it, you know, uh, which is crazy. Uh, but what we could do is encourage people to think disruptively. We can encourage young folks to take risks. We can create a culture where we let people make mistakes and we teach them how to have grit. Grit is extinct as a concept now in today's world. It's so yeah. sad, but we have to teach grit because that's the milieu that creates the right kinds of innovation to, to get us to break out of this stagnation that we're in, you know? Exactly. And, yeah. um, so for going going by by the example um which which i i love i love the analogy of of the ipod um in that case the the components from a technical perspective the components were largely there if not all there and it was about essentially rearranging the components in a in a novel way that mm. it made it easier to interact with from a from a human perspective, um, do you think that in in the NLP space we're in a in a similar space at the moment? Where um, yeah, in a similar space to that, or do, or do you think that there's still um, some gaps to be filled to get to that level? I love the question because you're you're touching on something that's really important here, and it's to understand the importance of. This, the sociological and psychological way that we work, right? Because the right now, people are really upset, obsessed with the things, with mm -hmm. the tech, with what it can do, with how does the network work? How does yep. this model work? Yep. We're really obsessed with that. We're obsessed with the components. We're obsessed with the, the, new, the new trinket. But we're not thinking in a way of filling the void in people's lives. Yeah. So we bring to market, we are, innovation, you see the beautiful thing about Apple's innovation isn't so much that they created new gizmos and gadgets, mm. right? Even the laptops weren't the fastest in the market. You know what I mean? Like the gizmos and gadgets isn't where the innovation was. The innovation was in conceptualizing the journey of life and that struggle, right? It's yeah. empathizing with the human, uh, the human trial that is living the experiences we live. Mm -hmm. If you empathize with that trial and you think from the standpoint of how do I bring more delight into that life? Th this cultural element, I mean, Apple was like a hype cycle in of itself. Simplicity, uh, delight. You don't even hear that stuff anymore. Companies don't talk like that anymore. It's like, what, what do they say now? It's like customer excellence or some shit, some yeah, shit yeah. like that, right? But, but it's like the delight, the, the empathy. It's like, oh my gosh, you know what? I wake up and the sun's in my eyes and I'm not getting good sleep. Mm -hmm. That matters. Let's create a technology for that. Now, let me, let me go into my grab bag of gizmos and gadgets and almost ignore their how they're built and think about how they can be integrated yeah. to bring the light into that user's life. And, and this is what's missing. I've gone through the journey of building chatbots with biggest, the biggest companies on the planet. And if you look at their process for building chatbots, a simple insight of 
um, you know, the, the, their process will miss completely the concerns of the people, the, the, the stuff that people actually want to ask this conversational AI experience. They'll be like, no, I've got the manual to our business processes. Yes. You take the manual and you turn it into a chat box. And 90% of their questions have nothing to do with what's in that manual, yeah. right? Like people want to know, like, let's do HR. Let's do HR, an HR bot, right? The HR, the HR division is going to be like, oh, we have all of our processes documented in tome number seven of this processes documentation. Let's take that and turn it into chatbot. If one, somebody has a question, all the answers are in there. But the question is like, oh, next Sunday, it looks like my school has an unexpected outage. Uh, like the kids are going to be home. Uh, I want to know, do you know if, what are other people doing no. with, with the kids home? Is there a daycare or some something out there? They want some information. They need help with their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's, you try to bring that into the conversation. So I would always encourage uh, the, the builders, the, the building methodology to be, before you build a, anything, go and find out what people are actually saying. And you build to that spec. You build to the spec of the landscape of what people are actually spending most of the time talking about. You build to that spec. Throw your manual in the trash or, or just use it as a reference for the spec that you're building for it. So the spec is not your content. It's not your knowledge management system. And, and this is the thinking, right? So, so if you want a phenomenal experience that touches people's lives in AI, you have to think about how to integrate these experiences in ways that reduces pain mm. or, or brings delight. That's it. Actually, I coach, uh, I coach some CEOs. I have a couple CEOs that I mentor. And I, I mentor people on product. And the, I spend all my time talking about, think about the void that you're filling in the life story of someone. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's no. It doesn't matter how cool that is. It doesn't matter that they're talking about, what are they talking about now? The metaverse. Metaverse, metaverse. Ah, oh, let's do metaverse. Investors too, they miss this. Oh, metaverse. Oh, you have a, a new NFT in the metaverse? <laughs> Invest. That's the future. Yeah, okay. Now tell me that investment. Tell me the story, the narrative of the void that you're filling for some human mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is suffering or how are you bringing delight to some yeah. human, a delight that's sustainable? Like if you can't answer those questions, that's a bad investment. If you can't answer those questions, it's a bad product idea. Yeah. If you don't have those answers, don't go build anything, right? right? Because, because I don't know, that's like a crapshoot. That's like playing the lottery, you know? Like just let's do something cool and then hopefully it changes the world, right? And, and, and so uh, when you want this, the, like this is the thing and that's a, that's a psychological thing. I mean, that's, that's a very deep thing because people do get excited about tech. Yeah. But they forget that to create value in this world, you've got to fill a void of pain or an opportunity to delight humans in a sustainable way. You know what I mean? Um, you also see this. You also see this when great products get crappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this happens all the time. There'll be a great product. And then it just gets worse over time because they're fixing things that aren't broken. <laughs> And they're improving on things without the sensibility to envision the journey in that, that user's life. So I, I, I talk about, I think this is the one, this is one thing that a lot of startup entrepreneurs miss completely because they're reading too many, they're reading too much internet and they're not thinking about the humans yep. in their lives and themselves as humans, right? Um, you know, there was this, there's, there's other things going extinct that people <laughs> are forgetting. There's the concept of dog fooding. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's bombastic to say it go, it's going extinct, but you don't hear this in the, in the nomenclature and in the air anymore of dog foodings. When you think about some of the best companies on the planet, it's companies like even Facebook, man, like Facebook was Zuckerberg building it for himself, really. Yeah. Right. People don't build. The first thing you'll hear product people say is, OK, how are you doing the user research? OK, mm -hmm. let's let's get the users. What are the let's go analyze. Let's build a process around user feedback and yeah. whittle that down into the roadmap, user feedback yeah. to roadmap. 
What's your systematized, scalable way of doing that? Okay. I mean, you could you can run that for the fringe, for the for the extra odds and ends on the core idea. You can't develop a core idea that way. There's no process that you could have run at the iPod that would tell you, get rid of all 43 buttons and make it a circle. I would, I would submit, right? That yeah. they're gonna be like, ah, I need a button here, because users don't know what they want often. Correct. You have to experience it with empathy and have a vision for that. And then it's like, if you want to change the look and feel or something or make buttons closer together or farther apart, run your user study. But your user study doesn't solve everything. You have to, you have to use your gut and you have to use your insight about human suffering, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you can alleviate it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mate, this is, this is fantastic. I, yeah. I, I love the, the focus on, on the product side and, and beyond that, on the emotional side, that mm -hmm. essentially we're, mm -hmm. we're emotional beings. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to be, and we like dealing with um, interactions, you know, that have, have an emotional component and that ideally leaves us in a better emotional state than, than what we found ourselves in before. Um, are there, in, in looking at the landscape from, from that perspective, which is, super refreshing right <laughs> um are there any particular areas of of um greater friction um or any particular areas where where um you get frustrated that you're like this could be better this could be solved this could be yeah. um yeah. are there any particular applications or any yeah. any particular yeah any any areas where yeah. you think yeah we absolutely. can do better Absolutely, absolutely, and and it's it's it, man, it's all over the place. Let, well, I'll tell you one in a more B two B context. Uh, yeah. There's a project I'm working on called Zero Shot Bot, mm -hmm. and this 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 Zero Shot Bot is uh, is a company where 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 we're developing technologies that focus entirely on the journey of creating the conversational AI experience. It turns out that there's an incredible amount of pain. If you have to collect data, if you have to anticipate all the ways somebody might ask a question and program that in or add it to your yep. data set to click a train button. Yeah. I mean, in, in the market, I've seen that takes a company 12 to 18 months. You know, I've worked with literally, I don't know, three of the top six banks on the plant on, in the world on this on building bots. And, um, you know, it's. It takes 12 to 18 months because they're going through this data collection curation. It's unwieldy. Uh, and the zero shot but concept is to reduce that, that friction, like to reduce that pain yeah. and allow people to just express simply uh, what the answers are. And then the bot builds itself, right? And it uses the zero shot learning te technology I was talking about earlier. And so what we have, I mean, there's companies uh, that are, uh, like Egenera, who built a bot on this technology, and they spent about two days building the bot as opposed to 12 months. And all you have to do is figure out what, what you want the bot to say. You don't have to train it, right? Because it's zero shot. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to train it. You just put the answers in, and then you can launch it. So in two days, they built it. It was up on their website about a week later. Shit. And the next week they sold product without any humans for the first time. Like there were, there, there were folks coming on and they were learning about, it's a very technical set of products. Uh, alternate eSource is the name of the company. I might've gotten that wrong. eGenera is another partner that we're launching with. Uh, alternate eSource is a, it's a very technical product, right? And so you could learn about the product and then they were making sales on the site without having to talk to someone about the product and whether it fits their use case. And, and that was, that was removing the pain of creating a conversational AI experience. You know, this incredibly hard thing. And not a, lot of fo not a lot of folks are looking at, there's two things people are looking at. Like one thing that people focus on, it's what's the quality of the end experience, mm. right? Is it quality? Yeah, and I actually built a whole company on that uh, and that grew massively, like very rapidly and had the biggest contracts. Uh, just on the quality, but we had a process in the prior company where you'd have to train it, get the data right, correct it. You want to add a new feature, you got to relook at all of your data, make sure your data is clean. And it was this arduous process. You can't scale the intelligence. So on this zero shot bot uh, uh, company that's launched now, 
Um, we focus entirely, of course, we have the quality, but we focus entirely on the journey of getting that experience built for your use case. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was a that's an example of focusing on the pain in the in the lives of people. And it's complicated because when you the experience of the bot focuses on the pain in the downstream user, the end user. But if you look at the market, not a lot of companies are getting good experiences out. And part of the, the reason that is happening is because of the pain of the folks that are own the experience that have to build these conversational AI experiences. And so that's, that's an example of um, what happens when, when you create products that focus less so on the tech, because there's so many cool tech things we could do, and it could require more training and be even better experiences at the end. But focusing on the journey of getting it for your use case is one of those uh, cases where, where, you, where you, you look at a, a, a gap. Um, and there's others, there's others more, more relatable, right? So that's tech, that's very, that's very business oriented, you like pain, but, um, you know, one of the, one of the pains and I'll talk a little bit about, uh, one of the companies that, uh, I'm on the board of directors of, um, they, 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 one of the visions in this company, uh, was to build an experience where you can, um, conversationally or by other means uh, account for all the, all the purchases you make that you get stuff shipped mm -hmm. and then you send it back to get reimbursed. So the, the concept was to get that automatically reconciled yeah. because it's very, it's very anxiety producing. Like if I buy three dresses or three shoes, three pairs of shoes, and then one fits and two don't, I have to send it back. And who knows when I'll get reimbursed? Yeah. Like who knows when it goes back in my account, which will allow me to buy more stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's stressful, mm -hmm. that's pain. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you eliminate that out of people's lives where they can send stuff back because now you can't go to, you can't go to the store. People aren't going to the store that much, man. Brick and mortar is going extinct. And nobody yeah. goes to return stuff in the store as much. People are sending stuff back. But there's a, a real bank account where you got to get that stuff back in. And the, 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 the void of not knowing where you stand in that, in that journey, in that exchange, is anxiety producing. And it can lead to financial anxiety, which is sad. Like, I, nobody wants to feel un, good, unsure. Yeah. And so this yeah. was an application that would automatically track all of that for you. So basically, when you send something back, it knows. And then it knows what you're waiting on. Yeah. It can make predictions as to when things are going to come back and it'll ding you when it comes back. So you don't have to cool. go and like look at your credit yeah. card statement yeah. or like go and I don't know, call them and hey, did it happen? Like that's friction in life. Yeah. That's, that's, that's suffering. Uh, and so this, one of the product ideas was to alle alleviate that suffering. There's other there's other ideas they're working on now related to taxes because there's a lot of suffering there too yeah. Yeah. for investors. But that was one of the concepts, and it's a it's a great example of um, how you can. And the company is called Reconcile, by the way. It's a really sharp CEO, uh, you know, and he's he's scrappy and young. Uh, he's he's raised some money. He's out there doing his thing. He's a brilliant guy. Um, uh, uh, so so check out Reconcile if you know you're interested. But but uh, but that's another. Uh, a core key idea, right? A key example of what could drive innovation in a way that actually sticks and actually Im improves society. Uh, you know, we have to think about that as, as AI technologists. We have to start thinking more in those terms and less so about what cool buzzword, burnt, yeah. uh, you know, distilled burnt, super burnt, Ernie, yeah. like what, whatever buzzwords you use to try to get investors to give you money. Like we got to stop doing that because that's not where the innovation is, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and what what I find um, fascinating about your focus is that you're on the on the cutting edge of innovation in so many different realms. So the 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 focus on removing pain, uh, emotional pain, or delighting a human mm -hmm. um, that's that's <laughs> something that. Um, is is happening 
I guess, kind of like slowly, it's a trend that I'm seeing slowly grow in business. Um, mm -hmm. One, but but definitely like not happening in AI. And I love also the, the product focus that you have in AI. What I was going to say in terms of the, the, the trend of delighting um, humans or taking away pain from them, mm -hmm. I saw, I noticed that, um, and this is an example that maybe didn't work as well, but definitely a big, a big one from Airbnb. Mm -hmm. When I saw a bit of a, a bit of a shift going from the traditional Airbnb of you know rent your place mm -hmm. to wanting to provide experiences in a new city, and they the the my understanding is that the vision of the CEO was to say mm -hmm. you are the the star of a movie who is traveling to another city, and I want you to have that movie experience where you. Mm -hmm. You know the best bars, you get the best experiences, you go on that hot, hot air balloon ride and like you come back to your hometown and you're like, that was amazing. That was amazing. And, yeah. that, and that level of emotional delight yeah. is, is something that I'm really um, excited that, yeah. that, I, that I see growing in, in, in business right. and, and uh, I haven't come across many examples Right, but like that's exactly where where your mind yeah. is at. Like your yeah, your yeah. mind and your heart is set on that yeah, with yeah. AI from a product yeah. perspective at an emotional yeah. level. Yeah, um, yeah. What took you there? Yeah, no. Well, you know, it's 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 very interesting, right? Um, but you know, you're right. That CEO gets it, right? And that's almost that's something you can almost imagine comes from the heart and the gut. Like he's been on trips, and he probably asked himself uh, at some point, man, why can't I? It's so much anxiety to have a great experience. It's it's yeah. so much pressure. When you spend when you spend five thousand dollars on a trip, if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that, and then you have to make sure that you 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 make that experience worth it. Yeah. So you got to plan, and you have to. It's a, it's and then you 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 go there and just risk. You have chose the wrong thing, or you miss the big thing you're like everyone knows to do but you just didn't get yeah. the memo it's so much so that's that's exactly right and i think what you know honestly i think the it's an insight and honestly insights come from a few places and some of these insights change your life and this is advice yeah. to all the folks over there uh, out, out in the world like you you sh if you have a spirit that you're always pursuing insights you're always looking for phenomenal mentors that that you can learn something from. That's where you build these things. On the journey, at somewhere along the line, this insight uh, became very clear. And, and integrating, integrating and asking the questions as to what makes A successful and what makes B not successful will let you get on that journey of discovering how to be better, think better, and to change your mental framework, change the model you have for the world. And I tell this to my PhD students and other folks, like what we're doing in life is we're building mental models. And a model is something that predicts outcomes mm -hmm. and your models change all the time. And they should change in the way that you become better at predicting outcomes. So, and this is what we all do as humans. And this, this is actually what we do organizationally too. A VC company has a model yep. that they believe will help them predict winners at a higher rate. And, and you tune that model with learning. So learn fast and learn always and question yourself. And scientists, a scientific way of thinking that someone really takes on is gonna get them to a, a good practice in this exercise where they can challenge their own thinking. So they build a better model so they can make better predictions. That is, if I have three ideas and my model is telling me the ideas that remove suffering or increases the light has a higher likeliness of having an impact in this world. Let's say I learned something on the journey that gave me that new addition to my model. Mm -hmm. Then you can operationalize that model. You can utilize that model to make better predictions and to have more mastery in whatever you're doing. So, so maybe if someone listens to this podcast, this is, this is a nugget that can help them tune their model, but life is this journey of, of, of doing this modeling, right. And learning from our experiences and learning from our mistakes. Uh, and you, you have to, 
you have to get out of your comfort zone and make mistakes and, 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 and get, get challenged. You have to be challenged in order to improve that model. And so, and so that's where it comes from. It comes from a journey where I always try to test ideas and test my own dogmas and, and certainties. Uh, and then you discover these nuggets that are gems that help you make good predictions. And that's actually how I run myself. And that's, I attribute a lot of my success to that. And you can call it learning quickly or learning how to learn or learning how to grow. It's to that and it's to grit. That means you persevere. You may see two things together, perseverance and an ability to adapt and learn. And you can achieve any of anything you dream to achieve in life. I, I'm certain those are the two elements, grit, learning how to learn, openness, conscientiousness. Like, like my boy, Jordan Peterson likes to praise. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it, mate. Yeah. That is, that is awesome. That is awesome. And yeah. I, I just looked at the time. I, I oh, like, yeah. the hour has flown by. I think that yeah. is an awesome note to end on. Jason, thank you so much uh, for your time today, mate. This has been Anytime. absolutely phenomenal. A blast. Anytime. It's my pleasure. And it's great to get to chat with you and meet you and, and uh, I look forward to connecting with you again soon, hopefully in person. That sounds yeah. great. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I hope that you got a lot out of this discussion. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the channel um, so more people can find out about the challenges that leaders have in the analytics and AI space. And that's what we're trying to share in Data Futurology. Uh, so please like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's episode, uh, please tell your friends. Thank you so much.